he uh, gave voice in a really brilliant way um, to the aspirations of uh, black people um, in a way that white people could understand and hear. Um, from the beginning of uh, the country, even before the beginning of the country, black people were trying to express to the country um, the degraded position into which they had been plunged. Um, but the country couldn't hear. Now, obviously, King didn't do it all by himself. The time, the context, and everything else made it possible, but um, he was a brilliant man, a great orator, um, a uh, great selector of AIDS, um, and had lots of brilliant, brave people around him. Um, and that conglomeration of talents um, made it possible for him to not only communicate, but lift the spirits of uh, blacks and whites who thought the country needed to change. Well, I think it's, I think it's impossible to um, deal with what ifs. Um, you know, as a Washington Redskins fan, I say, what if Martin Sch Marty Schottenheimer had been a sane man instead of a Martinette? Maybe we'd have had a decent season last year. So, um, you, it, I do know that at the end, um, uh, he was planning a poor people's campaign here in Washington, um, a campaign which did not achieve what I suspect it would have achieved had he lived to lead it. Um, I know that the country's attention on poverty decreased significantly after 1968. Um, had he been able to tell the story of poverty across racial lines as he had intended to, it is entirely possible that um, the problems of America's poor would not be nearly as acute today as they are. He was born in 1929 um, in Atlanta, and uh, there's something important about him that I think people don't understand, and that is that um, uh, Martin was born right on the cusp of the uh, Depression, and he was one of the few blacks of that generation of whom it truly could be said he was a baby born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, his father was uh, the pastor of a major black church in uh, Atlanta and was therefore one of the most substantial black citizens of that city or of, of any city. Um, and Martin um, was a smart person. Um, he received a superb education at uh, Morehouse College, at, uh, at uh, Crozier Theological Institute, and at uh, Boston University. Um, so he, 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 he entered adulthood with two great advantages that most black people didn't have. Um, he had a kind of security that came from this solid, uh, well-to-do family. And he could have, I'm sure, have just gone back, been his father's assistant pastor, sat around, done assistant pastoring until his father died, and then inherited the church, which would have, he would have been set for life. Um, but he, so he had this, this security that came from the family, and he was superbly well-educated. Two things that um, set him apart from the vast majority of blacks of his generation. Um, and that, then he went, uh, uh, he went to uh, Montgomery, and life proceeded from there. Well, I think it, look, you could not have been black in America during segregation and not have understood that this was wrong, deeply, profoundly wrong, and at odds um, with all the things that America professed about itself. Um, Martin was born in deep segregation, um, uh, although Atlanta was a much more civilized place than most of the Deep South. Um, but there, there, I, mean, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri in segregation three years after he was born. And you felt 
you felt the constrictions on all sides. And if you ventured out from the black community, you felt, uh, you felt the uh, opprobrium <laughs> that you hadn't earned. Um, uh, and, you, 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 and you were told at every turn that these were things that you couldn't do. So, and his, you know, his, his family was, uh, they were intelligent, involved, engaged people. So um, he learned it from the everydayness of his life and he learned it from his parents. Um, and you, you, I don't, you just, there were very few black people, I mean, there may have been some, you know, a tiny fraction who said, well, yeah, this is the way things should be. But the vast majority of black people said, this can't be. Uh, and when he, got to it, when he got to Montgomery, the other thing, there are a lot of people in this society who believe that the civil rights movement began in Montgomery, Alabama. Well, that's not true. And that it maybe ended when, uh, when uh, uh, Martin was killed in Memphis in 68. But black people had been struggling against white oppression as long as there were black people in this country. And the mid-century context um, in which uh, Martin's work uh, began was set really by people who had struggled in all kinds of ways, organized ways for the NACP from 1910, the uh, 1909, I guess, the uh, uh, National Urban League of a uh, few years after that, um, blacks and whites are struggling together to change the country. Then there were three, four great people in a huge event. The great people were um, Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion, um, Marian Anderson, the great uh, soprano, um, Jesse Owens. These three people um, were black people who, in the pre-war days, I guess Anderson was a contralto, uh, were black people who the whole country admired. Um, and it put into the consciousness of the people that maybe, maybe these things, as of some people, of decent people, maybe we have been wrong about these people. Uh, maybe there is something more about them that our culture is not telling us. Then World War II came, and we fought this war for democracy and uh, against uh, fascism and against dictatorships, uh, for human rights. And there was something powerfully uh, contradictory about fighting such a war with a segregated army. Um, and I think the country understood that it had made a dreadful error in, in uh, interning the Japanese Americans um, and in segregating blacks and Asian Americans uh, in the armed forces. So when we came back, the country felt good, expansive, and then there was another American who changed things, and that was Jackie Robinson, uh, with you know great help from Branch Rickey, who owned the Dodgers, ran the Dodgers. But that, it, all of a sudden, the country was re more ready to reassess its relationship with uh, its, the black segment of its population. Um, and the NACP in, uh, in Montgomery uh, had been working along with this idea, uh, developing this idea, and training people um, to challenge segregation on the buses. So all those things were in place when Dr. King went to, went to uh, Montgomery and um, it's lucky he did. <laughs> um, I am not sure that I could t tell you um, his politics, uh, his, his political affiliation, but I surely can tell you that he would be really upset um, with the idea that uh, um, we ought to be giving huge tax breaks 
to the wealthiest people in the society and make it in, making it impossible to uh, make the situation of the poorest people in the society better. Um, you know, the 90s was this great boom that we keep on talking about, but uh, there were still lots of people left behind. The unemployment rate, the poverty rate in this country was still about 12%. Um, the black uh, unemployment rate and poverty rate was much higher than that. Um, but there, white people, black people, Hispanic people, Asian people across the board, there were, there were people in poverty. King believed that you could not have a real democracy and that people couldn't have their full rights as long as economic opportunity was, was closed to them. So I think he would be struggling against, um, he would, I'm sure he would be uh, arguing for a repeal of uh, the bulk of that tax cut and um, to uh, stop the idea that uh, the estate tax should be, should be ended. Well, I think that his good friend and uh, lieutenant, uh, Reverend Walter Fontroy, uh, who did so much to uh, get us home rule when he was um, our representative in Congress, Representative uh, Congressman Fontroy and, um, and Congresswoman Norton would have called King and say, Martin, you got to help us here. Uh, this is outrageous. Uh, we pay taxes. We uh, serve in the armed services. Uh, um, we live in the capital of what is called the free world, and uh, we can't. We don't have any you know, vote in the House, and we don't have any senators, and uh, it's an outrage. And King would have uh, come, and he would have helped. And uh, I suspect that with the great moral authority that uh, he could have brought to bear, that um, we might might now have democracy here. One of the problems that King could have really helped us with. One of the problems is people across the country have no idea that we sit here as citizens of this country and citizens of the capital and have no representation in the Senate and have only uh, a non-voting representative in the House and we pay all the taxes and we send the kids to the Army just like everybody else does. It's, it's a, it, is, it is absurd, it is, it is obscene, it is wrong. People don't care. Martin could have uh, helped us get that message out, and I think I think we would have had a constitutional amendment a long time ago um, to give us full um, full citizenship. It, the, the times were it it seemed to me in 1955 uh, that uh, segregation in the South was immutable. By that time, my family had moved north, and the South seemed like a different place to me, and a place that I didn't want to go to. Um, I was, I guess, 23 years old at the time and in, in law school, and uh, most black people thought, I think, that the South could not be changed. When uh, Rosa Parks refused to uh, change her seat, um, the leaders of the city couldn't settle on a, one of the established ministers to lead the campaign and so they turned kind of in a compromise to this young man, well-educated young man. And um, he just struck absolutely the right note. Um, his, uh, he was able to heal the breaches between the other leaders. Um, his freshness and his attractiveness um, appealed to people across the country. Um, then there was a bombing, and he didn't stop. Um, there, are, I think, I need to say this, people, uh, the, the, the Martin Luther King holiday celebrations really narrow him and make him a caricature of what he was. I knew him, he was a friend of mine, and he wasn't just an orator, he wasn't just a guy who made one speech down here on the mall. Um, yes, he was a great orator. He was also brilliant. He was very, very, very smart, and he was shrewd. He was shrewd at picking his associates and people he relied on. He was shrewd in, in, in his uh, calculations about where to go and what to do. Um, and he was brave. I think he was the bravest person I ever knew.
because once that bomb went off in Montgomery, he'd wake up every morning. I can't imagine how, what this would be like. He woke up every morning and knew there were people out there who wanted to kill him. He didn't have any Secret Service to take care of him. And when I was in the Justice Department, uh, between, uh, well, when I was doing civil rights in the government from uh, 1964 uh, to 69, I was privy to lots and lots of reports of threats on his life. So I had a sense, not all the reports, but many of them, and sometimes we would, we would when they really looked uh, serious, we would pass them on. I, I, don't, I don't think that from 1955 to 1968 that I possibly could have endured the, the threat to life. So um, in Montgomery, the people got in one package an extraordinary human being, and that was, they were lucky, and the country was lucky. No, I don't think that uh, we're truly free. Um, We've made progress. This is certainly not the country that King and I were born into back uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. It's, uh, things have happened in this country that would have been inconceivable to us as we, when we were children or to our parents. We couldn't have conceived of uh, a black secretary of state, particularly a black secretary of state appointed by a conservative Republican president, or a black national security advisor who was also a woman. Um, uh, we probably couldn't have uh, conceived of a black uh, uh, Supreme Court justice or a black CEO of Merrill Lynch or uh, AOL Time Warner, but there, there we are. Uh, on the other hand, um, I'm a member of the school board here in the District of Columbia, and I can tell you that uh, my judgment is that uh, the most severe civil rights issue in the country is uh, our inability uh, as a nation um, to deliver effective education to the poorest minority children in the inner cities of this country. And as long as those children uh, are, are wounded by the educations they're receiving, some of them going straight into juvenile detention and then into prison, um, um, black men are free, and I would say, with Martin, as long as the, there's injustice anywhere, there's injustice everywhere. So, I don't feel like a free man, as even though I have a, a good job and so forth. Um, as long as uh, some American children are being systematically deprived of their uh, of their opportunities to live, and when adults in politics are playing a very, very cynical game um, with, their, with educational strategies which are not designed to help the children but to make political points. I suppose the uh, pivotal... Um, Montgomery really catapulted him into uh, world prominence. Um, and his study, he, he, he thought about what they had done and, and what made them successful um, and, and, and why the country was so was engaged with him. Uh, and uh, it, seemed to, it seems to me that uh, um, the... Uh, and, and one of the things we've always known was that the black church is at the heart of the black culture and that it has... If, if you always had this feeling, if you could only harness the power of the black church. Well, what they did in, what they did in Montgomery uh, just drew activist young ministers to King and his associates. Um, and they understood their power. And, but King wanted to deepen his understanding. He read uh, Gandhi deeply. He went to India to understand it so that when the 60s came, he was, he was truly ready. And... Uh, um, he was, um, by the time he was, a, he was 31, he was, he, was, he was a pretty wise, tough guy. Well, obviously, I don't know the mm -hmm. situation down there, but, uh, and I can only say that uh, he's, he's, he's very effective because he's put the issue on national television and uh, 
I suspect he's getting help, but all you can do is keep on. There's pl plenty of injustice in this society, and uh, and uh, you just keep on struggling where you can, and you sound like you're doing that. I can't tell you what Dr. King would think. I can tell you what I think as a parent, and that is that I have three children, two of them grown, um, and they weren't ready to decide what they were going to do when they were in the ninth grade. And I've got a third child who has, uh, is a sophomore in college, and she's a very, very uh, intelligent young woman, but uh, she hasn't come close to deciding, so I think ninth grade is pretty early to decide. Um, by the 60s, um, I, I suppose King was one of the uh, most famous people in the world. Uh, the Kennedys, for whom I worked and who changed my life trajectory by hiring me at the age of 30, um, really were not, they were not hot on civil rights. Um, I don't say it was a personal thing, although I think they didn't really understand very much about blacks because they were rich guys, the brothers were. Um, but they did, the, the Democratic Party had a very powerful southern wing. Uh, and Kennedy had won by a hair's breadth, and the main thing on their minds was winning the 64 election, and they needed the South with them, and so they wanted to go slow. And uh, they, they uh, really wanted King uh, to, uh, to stop the demonstrations and uh, maybe go for voting rights, which everybody could kind of agree on, uh, basic right. Um, the problem... Uh, was that uh, black people having pushed as far by this time, of course, the Supreme Court. I mean, even bef I would say that one of the things that I forgot to say is that, that I think that uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board in 1954 had a big impact on Montgomery. Black people weren't ready to slow down. Um, King did not slow down. Um, Birmingham uh, there was a huge dispute between King and uh, the, the, the administration about whether doing the Birmingham um, campaign was uh, was right or wrong. The, the, uh, Bob Kennedy said, well, King is wrong to use those kids. Uh, um, he didn't, and the criticism was just echoed throughout the administration. Um, my answer inside the administration was the kids were learning more on the streets about being um, effective citizens than they would be uh, learn in all year in those segregated schools they had in Birmingham. It was, it was a ferocious argument. Uh, blacks didn't slow down. Um, and because they didn't, um, what, what happened was that uh, the Kennedy-Johnson administrations were moved um, by the popular movements in the street. Uh, to take the actions they did. President Kennedy responded very well to uh, the resistance to Meredith uh, in Mississippi, Meredith, go, uh, James Meredith going to the University of Mississippi, responded well and profoundly both to the death of murder of Medgar Evers in Mississippi and the deaths of the three girls who were blown up in the church, in uh, four girls in uh, Birmingham. So. Um, and he was brought along by all of those events so that he really did make uh, um, racial justice a moral part of, of, of his presidency. And, uh, but that was, that was because uh, King and the others would not slow down, would not take his advice. Um, I can't, uh, you know, uh, Martin, uh, Martin hasn't been with us for uh, 30 years. Four years. I can't tell you. It's just—it's impossible to tell you what what he would have done on August fifteenth. Uh, yeah, I'll probably be there. Um, I what I've said is uh, very clear. That uh, that uh, poor kids, uh, particularly poor black kids, and their parents are not getting a fair shake in this country. And as long as and, and we're destroying American citizens by. Uh, uh, refusing to give them the tools to make them competitive in this highly competitive society. Look, at the age of... Uh, the, the, somebody said, well, the man from Monroe, Michigan said, well, he can't imagine my not being, not feeling free. If this country were a fair country, if our school system in Washington, D.C. Uh, really was educating kids and uh, their parents had a fair shake, 
I, at the age of 70, would not be on the school board. Um, I don't do the school board because I love it. I don't do the school board because uh, uh, I'm a, an education um, genius. I do it because that's where the struggle is. Um, and I believe that it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of patience um, for uh, this problem to be solved here and across the country. Um, and I believe that the problem we have in educating poor kids, particularly poor black kids, is a direct result of the deprivations of uh, segregation and slavery before that. And yes, this country needs to pay for that. We need to do that. And uh, if reparations is the way to get it, I don't care whether you get it, what you call it, but I want it fixed and I'm working to get it fixed and uh, so I'll be there. Uh, oh, well, I obviously can't respond to the pain uh, in the caller's uh, words about her own life. I will say that uh, I really believe in integration. Um, I think that uh, um, it, it is clear to me as a professor that most of the learning that kids do is from each other. I mean, we put the material out there, then they talk to each other, but they talk from their different cultures and their different backgrounds, and they bring uh, uh, powerful lessons to each other. If everybody's the same in a country where everybody, if, where, if everybody's the same in the classroom, in a country where everybody is not the same, then we're shortchanging the kids. Now, my own education, uh, where I was a black kid in a virtually all-white school, I think it was, it was painful at the time, but it was the most valuable lesson that I ever got because it taught me in the 1940s that whites were not a master race, which is what the culture told us, and it, it, it enriched my life uh, enormously. So I, I believe profoundly in integrated education and integrated workforce. I had a terrific wife, uh, who was supportive, Coretta, um, and uh, he had uh, the famous four little children who are now all grown up. Um, um, and uh, but I think you know uh, his family life suffered a lot because he was on the road a lot. His work took him took him away, and uh, I think that uh, he would have liked to have had uh, more time with his children. I'm sure that his children would have loved more time with him. People now act as if uh, they were with Martin Luther King when he was alive. You know, all kinds of conservatives say, oh, yes, Martin Luther King, he was the one, blah, 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 blah. And so you would think if you were born in 1968 uh, and didn't know anything, that King was the most popular guy in the country. He was not. He was, in fact, close to the most unpopular man in the country un up to the day he, he died. And not all black people liked him either. I mean, there were people in the civil rights movement who were jealous of him, didn't like him, said bad things about him. They said he was a headline hunter, and they said he was getting money from somewhere and he was banking it somewhere. Well, in the summer of 66, he brought his crusade to the north because he understood that the tactics in the south had pretty much been played out and the problems in the north were huge. He was in Chicago. And he had said that he was going to live in a, um, in a uh, ghetto apartment, in the ghetto. And cynics, friends of mine, said, ha ha, ghetto, it's the only gilded apartment in the ghetto. And, uh, and, uh, and he's, if he's walking upstairs, he's walking upstairs with his pocket stuffed full of money. I mean, I heard stuff like that. And it made me bristle because by that time he was quite a good friend of mine and I really hated it. So there was a riot in Chicago, and one of my jobs was to, was to try to figure out uh, how to end them. And uh, the president sent me out there, and uh, along with John Doerr, who was the assistant attorney general of, for, for civil rights, and we decided to go seeking. We got there late, and uh, the Illinois National Guard was in the streets. There was a curfew. So we went to call King, and we went down to his apartments. And it was indeed a ghetto apartment. I mean, it was in a rough street and uh, it was a walk up and you walked up uh, a stairwell where paint was peeling and, uh, and it was hot summertime and the higher you got the hotter it got because the sun had baked into the roof and we got to the top floor we knocked on the door and the door opened a crack and we thought that somebody was going to peek out well 
it wasn't that people, the, the person who was trying to open the door was peeking out, it was that he couldn't get it open. And the person who was trying to open the door was Andy Young. Well, Andy couldn't get it open because there were people everywhere in that living room. You opened it up and there was not a space. And so he finally got it open enough for John and me to get in and we walked over to a corner of the room and the heat in the room was overpowering because you not only had the heat from the outside but all these bodies stuffed in there. And uh, he just said, uh, um, here are uh, two friends of uh, ours uh, from, sent from the president and uh, well, they're going to have a meeting with us later on. And then he went back to doing what he was doing and I soon realized that what he was doing was teaching nonviolence to these kids. They were men, boys, teenagers. They were gang members. They were the kinds of kids that America fears and reviles. They're the kind of kids that people don't want to go near with a 10-foot pole. And what I understood was that these kids wanted to go out and protect their turf from the Illinois National Guard. That is, they wanted to go throw rocks and Molotov cocktails at armored personnel carriers and jeeps that had 50 caliber machine guns on them. What Martin was doing was saving their lives. He was preaching nonviolence to them. He was preaching the violence out of them. There wasn't a television camera in that room. There wasn't a reporter in that room. He had not known that John and I were coming. He wasn't doing this for the public. And here he was, preaching violence out of these despised kids. And he kept on. It didn't care how many times a question was asked, he would answer it patiently. And he answered it. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning before the last kid finally said, OK, I promise we won't do anything, and we'll come back and join you in some nonviolent activity tomorrow afternoon. It was only then that he let him go, and it was in a shotgun apartment. We walked down the hallway, and he stuck his head in one bedroom. And his kids were all in, in there sleeping in this apartment. And he stuck his head in one bedroom and said, Corey, um, uh, John and Roger are here from, from the White House, and we we're going to have a meeting. Would you uh, come on in and join us and fix us some coffee? And uh, we we're going to have a meeting. So we sat there in the kitchen at the kitchen table in this ghetto apartment. Mrs. King fixed his coffee and sat down, um, and we discussed uh, our plans for Chicago as the sun rose over the ghetto. I, that's the King I remember. Um, all I can say is that, uh, yes, we should make uh, higher education much more available, and the SAT, I think, is, uh, is not a good test. Now, for the rest of your plan, I don't know. Well, I agree with that. I don't think that um, I tried to imply that, and I think that I had said that there were white allies um, in the black cause uh, from uh, before the time of the revolution, um, Quakers in uh, Philadelphia, for example. So, um, and, and but you do uh, raise a point that needs to be emphasized. Um, I certainly do. Um, approve the idea of a Martin Luther King holiday. But the holiday does give you the impression that um, the whole civil rights movement was Martin Luther King, which obviously was not true. It was a movement, uh, a broad-based movement, blacks, whites, um, Latinos became involved. Uh, I knew some Asian Americans who were in the movement. so. Um, and uh, you're right, they weren't coerced. They came because um, they believed in the ideals of the United States and uh, they wanted to make the country better. Uh, and they weren't coerced, that's exactly right. Um, I was in the Justice Department with, with Hoover and uh, I will say that uh, I really, 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 um, I thought he was the worst public servant that I ever had wow. ever encountered. Well, because um, all the problems you see with the Bureau, all the, all the issues that you've seen raised about the Bureau's inability to deal with uh, the issues prior to 9-11 uh, um, are embedded in a culture that Hoover left. And it was a, it was a bureaucratic culture that was essentially self-protective. Uh, it was uh, promotional. 
uh, promoted itself, its image. Um, Hoover, um, it is now well known, kept dossiers on important people in Washington, especially King. He hated King. Among other things, Hoover was a virulent racist. He also, he also attacked me the whole time I was in the Justice Department. He used to send memos around the Attorney General, his nominal boss, to the White House about uh, what a rabid black power guy I was. Um, uh, and he tried to destroy King. Um, and he tried to destroy him by uh, uh, taping him. Um, uh, it's well known that uh, King had a robust uh, extracurricular uh, romantic life, um, and uh, Hoover taped that, sent it to Mrs. King, sent it to uh, uh, Martin, suggested that he kill himself. I mean, this was uh, this this, and, and he, d he did all kinds of things to undermine. Um, not only King, but, but all kinds of uh, constructive uh, movements for uh, greater democracy in the country, uh, anti-war movement, youth movements. Um, he, was, uh, he was really, truly an uh, and, uh, I always thought that the, the idea of an Un-American Activities Committee was, was an oxymoron. Um, but if there was any, ever a guy who I thought had on American values, it's Hoover, and I would take his name off that building. I think it's a, I think it, I think he dis disgraced the country. Well, I disagree with um, some of what you say. It is true that um, a large part of the Democratic Party um, um, up to the uh, 70s was rooted in the South. Um, it is not true, however, that uh, Northern Democrats. Um, uh, were not involved very powerfully along with moderate Republicans um, uh, to pass the civil rights legislation of the 60s. However, you, 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 the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Housing Act of 68, the Great Society legislation, all of those were sent to the Congress and pushed through the Congress and enacted into law by Democratic presidents. Um, they had bipartisan support uh, because in those days you had uh, liberal Democrats and moderate Democrats and, 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 and moderate and, 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 and moderately conservative Republicans who, all of whom formed a great block of uh, decency uh, in in, in uh, the legislation of those days. So yes, there were Republicans who were terrific, um, and uh, I don't uh, I don't uh, disregard them at all. But the leadership was uh, from Democratic presidents. Um, I was here, uh, but my one of my top assistants at that time, a wonderful man named James Lowey, was uh, with Dr. King in Memphis in the next room at the Lorraine Motel. So, uh, and it was Jim who, uh, Jim's dead now, he was just a wonderful guy, uh, who gave the first news to Washington that uh, King had been shot. Um, when I got the news, I called the department and uh, the Attorney General and Ramsey Clark and Deputy Attorney General Warren Christopher were already there and said, come on over. We spent practically the whole night there um, advising with, on the phone with the president, um, advising him. He decided that the next morning uh, we should, uh, the Attorney General, uh, Clifford Alexander, who was the head of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and I should go um, to Memphis um, to give his condolences to Mrs. King, which we did. And we saw Ralph Abernathy and uh, Andy Young and um, all the rest of the top SCLC leaders and they of course was just were just devastated.